Well done. Great to be with you this morning. I hope that you're pleased to be here. If you're a guest, uh, that's anyone who uh, has probably been here less than a couple times. If you haven't stopped by the welcome desk, please stop by there or fill out a little card. We'd love to get to know you. I'm on my fourth week of being here, so maybe I'm now no longer a guest. I'm, I'm part of you, and hopefully if you're a guest, you'll find UHBC to be a great place to be, and you'll be part of us. Uh, we've been going through a series called The Foundation of Our Faith. And what we're doing is we're looking at the 10 statements of what we believe that's in our church constitution. And uh, we're going to walk through those, what it means in a biblical context. But before we jump to those statements, we had to have a foundation for our foundation. And so we started off with this thought that our foundation has to be based on Jesus Christ, who's God, and whose word is the core and substance of our teaching and our values. So to put it simply, what we're saying is that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, what He says is the foundation of everything that we do. We build on that. We always come back and we ask the question, what does the Bible say about this? That's the question we should always be asking. We said we have to find out what the Bible says. That's what we know. We have to know the Word. Then we apply what it means. That's how we grow in the Word. Then we go in the world and we show what it means. We show the Word. That's when we make disciples. Then we talked about our mindset as a disciple because of the word. We, we explored this imperative about the world, uh, word that we have to love God, love people, and make disciples. Then last week we spent some time saying, okay, well, if our foundation is the word, if our mindset of the word is to be a disciple, we need to know how to study the word, to know the word. And we spent some time talking last week about an effective Bible study. And maybe you tried out uh, that study this past week. If you did, well done. If not, I'm not saying it's the perfect plan. It's a plan. Just do a plan to get deeper in the scripture. By the way, that's part of the purpose of the church when we gather together. The church comes from a, a little Greek word. It means a called out group or belonging to the Lord. A couple of aspects about that word church, depending upon how it's used in scripture and based on context, sometimes we can mean the universal church. Sometimes when scripture just talks about the church, they're talking about the church as a whole. That's anyone who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ, believers, whether they're alive or they passed, they're part of the church, whether they're on earth or they're in heaven, is part of that universal church. So sometimes scripture talks about the church as a large body, and sometimes it talks about the local church, where it refers to a body of believers in a particular house or in a particular location. For example, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul writes to the saints who are in Ephesus. It's a church in a specific place. Here we might say the specific church is University Heights Baptist Church in Stillwater, Oklahoma, a local church. So we're part of a local church, but we're also part of the universal church as believers in Jesus Christ. Now, when we understand church, we also understand it's a people, it's not a building. It's about people who place their faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life. They're in Christ, they're family. If you're not in Christ, you don't have that same unity. In other words, unbelievers can be at a location, but they're not part of the biblical concept of a church. Does that make sense? You can be here. You're welcome to come to University Heights Baptist Church, but you're not really part of the church until you are a believer, until you place your faith in Jesus Christ. An unbeliever doesn't make up the universal or the local church. From a biblical perspective, a church is always a body of believers, and that's important because the idea of a church and a body of believers determines then what we do when we gather together as family. It determines why we meet. It determines kind of what we do when we meet. So let's talk just briefly about the main purpose of the church. Inside the house, when we gather together as a body of believers, our main purpose is for teaching and training. In other words, church activities, why we gather on Sunday mornings, Bible studies, why we gather together for church events is mainly for teaching and training. It's where a body of believers Families are coming together to be trained, to be discipled, to understand our foundation, the Word of God in Jesus Christ. So there's fellowship in the family. There's conversations in the family. That's the main purpose in the local body. By the way, if you're part of a church that's having an evangelistic message every Sunday, they have a, a, a false understanding of what a church is. Because a church is mainly a body of believers. If you're having a gospel message every Sunday, that means either your church is full of unbelievers or you have a very spiritually immature church. 
Because this is believers gathering together to grow in the word. The main purpose in the house is not evangelism. The main purpose in the house is to know. It's to grow. It's to be together. It's to know the word. For example, if we gathered together and maybe we just met physical needs, we wouldn't be any more than a great social service. If the main purpose was fellowship, well, you can get fellowship in many clubs that are in town. That would just be a great fellowship. Our main thing as a church, a body of believers, is gathering together to know more about Christ and his words for teaching and training. That's an in-house occurrence. And when you have an in-house occurrence, you have in-house activities. For example, baptism is an in-house family activity. Everybody else thinks you're just dunking somebody in water. That's weird. Communion is an in-house activity, right? Everyone else would just think, well, that's a weird meal. It's really tiny, right? A little bit of bread, a little bit of juice. That's awkward. It's an in-house activity. It's when we go outside the house that things change. That's when we leave here. We're trained, we're taught, we leave, we scatter for evangelism and discipleship. It's when we leave the fellowship of this body, where we get trained, we're equipped, we're ready to go, that we go out in the world, into our jobs, into our neighborhoods, with our families, where we do acts of service, where we do things in the community, where we love on others, where we are sharing and caring, we're sharing evangelism, what Christ is, we're making disciples. So that's our goal, is to take what we know, what we gather together to learn, and to share it with others wherever we meet them. So the church is where we get physically fed, and outside the church is where we apply what we've learned and what we share. That's important because understanding our purpose helps us discuss our statements of faith. Because our statements of faith mean nothing to anyone who's not part of the church. And we're going to look at these 10 big categories in our statements of faith. We're going to be looking at what we believe about God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, Bible, creation, salvation, the church, personal responsibility and freedom. Don't worry. It'll take us through December because we're going to eat an elephant like we do one bite at a time, right? So we'll spend a few weeks on some of these. We'll spend a little bit more on others. But today we're going to hit the first statement of our faith in our Constitution, and that is this. We believe that there is one and only one living and true God who alone is sovereign and worthy of worship. If you have your Bibles, I hope you already have those out. We're going to be in Psalm 145, verses 3 to 13. And we're going to start off with a couple of concepts that will kind of blow our mind probably by the time we're done. Because anytime we say the word God, we immediately ask, are we talking about God in the generic sense? Are we talking about God the Father? Are we talking about God the Son? Are we talking about God the Holy Spirit? And when we do, people begin to ask questions. Well, are you polytheistic? Are you saying there's multiple gods? Where people believe there's more than one God? Are we saying that there's three gods? No. The concept of the Trinity is the idea that there's only one God. Three separate distinct persons are then identified. You remember the, the song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It's a great hymn of the faith. And it ends up one in three persons, blessed Trinity, that's a great theological song. Blessed Trinity. See, as we go through Scripture, we're going to see examples of God at work uniquely and individually as God works. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, the Father is actually called God. It says, yet for us, there is one God, the Father. In John 1, 1, the Son is called God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Acts 5, 3 to 14, the Holy Spirit's called God. You test the Spirit of the Lord. Matter of fact, in the first message I gave here, uh, way back in March, in view of a call, we looked at Matthew 28. It highlighted all three roles of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in discipleship. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14 talks about uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit's role in our redemption. They're all involved in our redemption. Now, if you just want to have a fun definition of the Trinity that you can throw out at friends at parties, which I know we want to do, you might want to use this definition. There is one only and true God, but in the unity of the Godhead, there are three co-eternal and co-equal persons, the same in substance, but distinct in substance. In other words, there's only one God, we're called monotheistic, but there are three persons in that God, three, three mode, not three modes as some teach, like God jumps over here and he's God the Father and then he jumps over here and he's God the Son and then he jumps over here. Not that at all. Not three little gods, that would be tritheism. Not uh, like from the movie Multiplicity, and remember when you had multiple people, they were all doing the sentence, it's not what this is. 
The idea of Trinity means that God has a plurality of persons, but a, un a unity of his essence. Or we might say there's one what in the essence, but there's three who's in the person of that one. Or there's three eyes and there's one it. Or three subjects and one object. And the names then reflect the, the personhood and the specific responsibilities of God. So even though as God the Son operates, he maintains all the attributes of God. Even though God the Holy Spirit has certain roles, he maintains all the attributes as God. And they work in harmony with each other. God the Father is in harmony with God the Son, which is the Father with God, harmony with God the Holy Spirit, who is in harmony with God the Father. Now, if you're having a hard time grasping a concept of the Trinity, I promise you're not alone. Well done. That's the first lesson today is we can't quite figure out God because he's so amazing. Our goal this morning is we're going to try to understand who is God. We're going to look at some of the attributes of God, and we're going to come to a conclusion, and there'll be some application that you get to help me out with this morning. So I'm going to warn you of that uh, towards the end, that there'll be a, a responsive aspect that you get to be part of. As we start, though, we had, uh, thanks for David for reading, we looked at Psalm 145. A few things about the background of the Psalms, because we're taking this Psalm 145 kind of out of context. We want to make sure we understand what we're looking at. Whenever you look at the Psalms, the Psalms were always meant for singing. You can't get away from it. There's 150 Psalms with thousands of words, and they're meant to be sung. I won't sing it this morning. You're welcome. You're going to see this term often, selah, S-E-L-A-H, it's really interesting. It's a musical term. It either means to lift up like a, like a bow off of a violin or bow off of a stringed instrument. It sometimes may have been used to mean it's a crescendo uh, musically. Uh, basically, it's there because there's a pause whenever you say that word selah to emphasize what's going to happen right afterwards. So it's as I'm talking about I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. Does it make sense? It's kind of the setup, the encouragement. Secondly, the psalm means a book of praises or a book of worship. The Hebrew title for the psalms is a book of praises. The Greek title is a book of worship. So the songs are a type of hymn book that the nation had used to express, uh, express praise. And since they're a book of worship, they were used in the temple as a type of hymn book, a song book that could be a devotional guide for the people. So it was key to their worship. And number three, the Psalms were written for that purpose, for worship. There's multiple ideas that are in there. There's uh, worship is an, is an attitude, and it's all focused on the object of our worship or our worthship. What are we giving worth to? Who are we giving worth to? And the time span of the Psalms span about a thousand years. Can you imagine having a hymn book or a worship book that was a thousand years old? That's amazing. And they kept adding new versions to it over and over. It's still in its first edition. The Psalms record worship songs for about a thousand years from the time of Moses to when the Israelites returned from exile or about 1400 BC to about 400 BC. And most of us think that David wrote all the Psalms. He didn't. He only wrote 73 out of the 150. Moses wrote one. Solomon wrote at least two. The sons of Kor wrote 11. Hezekiah wrote 10. So there's multiple authors in those 1,000 years that we have in the Psalms. And then finally, Psalm 145 is identified as a psalm of praise. You're going to go, Rodney, why is that kind of a fun fact? Well, it's because it's the only psalm of the 150 to have such a title. And based on the title uh, about this song of praise, it probably means that the author uh, knew something about who God was. And we learn in that psalm, the psalm is identified with being with King David. And one thing you probably know about King David, he knew what it was like to worship God. He went all in, almost everything that he did, sometimes to his peril. The last six psalms, Psalm 145 to 150, emphasize praising God over and over again. The word praise appears 46 times in those last six psalms. Now, you're not a Hebrew scholar, I'm not really that either, but the Psalm 145 is written as an acrostic poem in the Hebrew language where each successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet starts each idea of that line. So it's written to be sung, it's written as an acrostic, and it's written through this kind of neat little thing of the Hebrew alphabet that would kind of make sense. It's very poetic. Now, with that out of the way, let's see if we can figure out what Psalm 145 says about understanding who is God. Because we know David was passionate about God. He wanted to know about God. He wanted to experience God. And though we only read a portion of Psalm 145, the entire psalm has a lot of neat things to say about God. 
In verses 1 and 2 and verse 21, they're kind of bookends. In verses 1 and 2, you have this idea about blessings and praise to God. Verse 21, he closes with praising God forever and ever. But in verses 3 to 13 are the reasons why the psalmist proclaims he can praise God. In verse 3, it's a very simplistic statement. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. First point is God is great. And his greatness there is tied in to being something unsearchable. So God is so great, or he's so remarkable, or he's of such great magnitude, he's so great we can't even know it. In other words, rational thought doesn't get how great God is. So right away we're left with a complex thought that we can't actually comprehend. How great is God? So great we don't get it. How great is God? He's so great we can't even know how great he is. So first of all, grasp that in our human understanding, we can't even begin to grasp how incredibly great God is. And if you begin to grasp how great he is, you're not even close yet. So if his greatness doesn't end, which is what the psalmist says, the conclusion of the psalmist makes some sense. He praises God for his greatness because it doesn't end. And the psalmist says he's going to make it his full-time job to remember God's greatness. Now it's fine for us to declare that God is great. It's appropriate for us to do that, but even in proclaiming God's greatness, where we don't fully comprehend what we're saying, maybe we need to think about how great God is just for a little bit. So we'll throw a few things out this morning, because I think when we begin to understand some of his attributes, it should blow us away how great our God is. And that's really what we're saying in this first statement of belief. God is and has omnipotence. It's a fancy word that means that God is all-powerful. When he uses that phrase, almighty, the word almighty is only used of God in the Bible. It is never used of mankind. Mankind cannot be almighty. It's used 56 different times in Scripture about God. So God's all-powerful, which means he's able to do anything that is consistent with his nature. Now, somebody has said, well, God can do everything. Well, actually, he can only do things that are consistent with his nature. For example, God cannot sin because that would go against his nature. So God can do anything that is consistent with his nature. And you can see some glimpses of God's power. You can see the power in a hurricane or in a gentle breeze. You can see it through creation and nature, through the flower, through the hummingbird. God is all-powerful, and the way it's written, it's an absolute. Uh, no one comes close to the power that God's had. He, he has authority over all things. He's the most powerful of all. Just end it there. The second concept, that is omnipresence. When we say God is omnipresent, it means that God is everywhere present. Man and angels are restricted to a specific space and time. In other words, if I'm here, I can't also be there wherever there is, right? I'm not here in Imponka City at the same time. It's an impossibility. We're, We're bound by this space and time. And yet if God created space and is the cause for space... The creator is always greater than the creation, and the cause is greater than the result. That means that if he's outside of time creating time, he can operate outside of time because he created time. And because God is perfect, he has to be everywhere at all times. And if you can control time and space, you get the picture, it begins to blow our brains. God is wherever his attributes are. That's why Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who was, who is, and who will always be. See, God's greatness is seen because it's always in the present tense, even when we think past and future, God is absolutely there. There's never a time in your life that God wasn't present. That's why we can say he will never leave you nor forsake you because he is always in the present tense. To do so, we go against his attributes. A third way that kind of blows my mind is that his omniscience. It's the idea that God knows everything This is beyond being smart. This is beyond being intelligent. Especially if God is the author of intelligence, we might as well just throw that out of the the way. It means that God knows everything. He knows everything that is actual, and he knows every potential possibility. The multi-universe, I mean, all those are the thoughts. He knows every potential thought. He knows all of our works from the beginning. He knows everything about our lives before we were ever born, or a twinkle in your parents' eyes. He knows before you were in your mother's womb. He knows our thoughts before we have them. He knows the end of our time, even though in our perspective it hasn't happened yet. He knows it all. Wow. One more thing, just 
if you haven't been blown away by how great God is. God is sovereign, which means he's an absolute authority. He's an absolute control over all things. His dominion is final. His dominion is perfect. He's free to dispose of his creation as he wills because he created it. He is the source of it. And he is perfect in all things. And he brings glory to himself in everything that he does. Man, we're kind of given property rights over creation in our role, but it's really just kind of temporary. It's permitted by God. We have some rule and authority we think we have, but God is over all things. And even though his authority, people call it in question, it never can be really in question because he rules over all. He rules over all even when we don't recognize he's in charge. Whenever countries don't recognize he's in charge. Whenever we don't recognize he's in charge, he is still absolutely in control. And the idea of God being sovereign means it's also exclusive. He's the only one in charge. No one else can be in charge. There's not a partnership that we have with God to be in charge. It is exclusive. He doesn't share it with others. Which means if God says there's only one way to be reconciled to him, then there's only one way to be reconciled to him because he's the one that's in charge. So knowing God is great, whether we fully grasp it or not, is a key to beginning to understand who God is and should just allow us to sit back and go, wow, God's incredible. The psalmist isn't done. He lists the more ways we can praise God. In verse 4, he mentions your mighty acts. Verse 5, wonderful works. Verse 6, your awesome acts. What can we know about God? We can know that God, number 2, has amazing works. The psalmist responds in praise. When he remembers the great acts of God, he remembers a few things that God has done and been in control of. The word mighty acts refers to the strength and the power of God. The idea of wonderful acts means something that's marvelous, supernatural, acts that defy the laws of nature. Awesome acts are, are acts that bring fear, where you're in awe, you're almost just stunned that just happened. And the acts of God are almost like folklore, aren't they? I mean, he created everything. That's a pretty big act. Uh, he does miracles. His word is absolute. He calms a storm at a word. He can heal someone and not be even around them. He can heal outside of country, go from country to country. Uh, the mute speak, the lame walk, the dead rise. It's because of his amazing and mighty acts. And it probably means we can't fully comprehend it because we don't know exactly how it happened, which means he is that much greater. But perhaps there's additional wonderful acts that help us realize who God is. Think about it for a moment, maybe the birth of a child, the gift of eternal life that we have, where we go from being dead to being alive, that's a crazy act. The healing of a loved one, even the dying of a loved one who's placed their faith in Christ, that at their last breath on this earth, they experience eternity with their Savior. That's a pretty wonderful act. This almost isn't done. Verse 8, he proclaims God to be gracious and merciful. Then in verse 9, he says, the Lord is good to all. Beginning to understand who God is, number three, we have to realize that God is good. To be good means you have the qualities that are desirable. God always has the positive qualities desired and that are suitable in any situation. So God always responds perfectly in every situation. Even though we don't like the situation we're in and we may not like the results of the situation, they are the perfect response. God always has the best response possible. God's decisions and God's ways bring the best goodness. Whether there's discipline or encouragement, whether there's rain or drought, God's response is always perfect and good. Even when we don't like it, even when we don't believe it, even when we can't see it. And the psalmist, David, sits back and he remembers God's works and he proclaims, your works are good. I know they're good. And that's key to understanding who God is. God is good. The psalmist continues, verse 10, he talks about works that bring thanksgiving. Verse 11, they speak of the glory of your kingdom. They talk of your power. Verse 12, speaking of the majesty of his kingdom. We have glory and power and majesty. All point to the reality, number four, that God is glorious. He is the best and the greatest of all. He is great and he is good. To have glory refers to the highest state of honor. It's the idea of maintaining all fame and all admiration. 
Nothing else can come close to the fame and admiration God desires and gets. Matter of fact, to call someone or something else glorious would be a misuse of the word. The word glorious really can only refer to God. He's the only one who is glorious or deserves glory because he alone is the source of all things that are good. So when we begin to grasp who God is and what he's done, one of the few things we can proclaim is God is glorious. God is amazing. God is almighty. And he deserves all fame. And the more the disciple realizes God is glorious, what we find is the, rest, the, the less that we think about ourselves, the less we bemoan our own situations and how bad it is for me, and I've got a tough life. So when you begin to recognize how great and wonderful God is, all the other things come into focus a whole lot easier. The more we're humble, the more we end up being gentle, and the psalmist proclaims, God is glorious. He doesn't stop there. Verse 13 he says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. See, understanding who God is, number five, is to realize that God is everlasting. God exists endlessly. God's eternity and self-existence and interrelated concepts. God is from everlasting to everlasting. You could have a, a line going this way with an arrow and a line going this way with an arrow. Mankind was created. We had a beginning, and we either have eternal death or eternal life. We don't have an end, but God has no beginning and no end. He was before there ever was a beginning in our life or creation, which is crazy. Everlasting to everlasting. Man can gain eternal life, but man had a beginning. God is eternal. He has no beginning, no end. And so there's no existence that he is limited in his time. There's no dependent. There's nothing he depends on. There's no cause. There's no push against how great our God is. Man is dependent upon God for our eternity. God is not dependent on anyone. And because God has no beginning and no end, his authority, his dominion, his glory, his goodness has no beginning and no end. It continues as perfect as it's always been. Therefore, we can count on God. We can count on his promises. We can count on his power. We can count on his truth. See, understanding who God is in that statement of faith is beginning to grasp the duration of his power. It's everlasting. I am not and you are not. He alone is. And we're really going to stop right there with the concept, but just let me throw in a few other things that are good in this passage. The psalmist goes on to say that God sustains us. In verse 15, he says that God is the center of all things. In verse 16, that God satisfies our needs, that he's the perfect provider. Verse 17, that God is righteous. Verse 18, that God is near and saves us. Verse 19, God hears our cries. Verse 20, that God loves us and he destroys the wicked. And David, the psalmist, he just gives reason after reason after reason why he wants to praise God. And they sit around this concept of trying to understand who God is. And David seems to guess, grasp it because in verse 21, he says, for my eternity, I will praise you. David gets what we're trying to say in that very simple statement of understanding who is God. It goes back to the statement, we believe that there is one and only one living and true God who alone is sovereign and worthy of worship. In that statement, we see God's exclusiveness, God's eternality, God's sovereignty, and even the response, much like David the psalmist of mankind, to worship him. Now, with that as our foundation of our first statement of belief, let me just suggest a few conclusions we can come from this psalm. Conclusion number one is that God is personal. I mean, God is great. He's huge. He's big. He's awesome. But he cares for you more than you even care for yourself. He cares for you even when you don't care for yourself or when you don't care for him. And that only highlights who he is because of his attributes and who he is. He loves you. He cares for you for all eternity. And certainly that includes the personal salvation message, but it includes discipleship. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He is with us. He's closer than a friend. He's closer than a brother. So no matter what you've gone through, I promise you, God is there. He's personal. Conclusion number two. This may seem silly, but God is all that matters. Until we get to a place where we realize it's all about him, 
we don't fully grasp who God is. God is all that matters, which means we have to reevaluate what we think matters to us. From an eternal perspective, work, your job, getting to the next run of the ladder, doesn't really matter. How your kids end up, or pleasing your spouse, or your hobbies, or what you like to do, what I want to do, really doesn't matter in the scheme of all things, because we fail to grasp how great God is. The things that matter to God is He wants you to know who He is. He wants you to grow as a disciple. He wants you to have that eternal perspective that it's all about Him. And I know someone's going to come up and go, well, Roddy, but, but you don't know my situation. It's tough. You don't know my spouse. They're difficult. I have teenagers. It's crazy. It's terrible. It's horrific. And again, that's again where we fail to grasp who God is. If God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, if he is sovereign, then he already has the power and the ability to take care of the things that we're trying to do all on our own. God cares about me personally. He loves me. And ultimately, we have to come to the conclusion God is all that matters. Number three, conclusion number three, God is our loving father. God is not a, a tyrant. He's not our little buddy and he's not Santa Claus. Our relation with God is an eternal one, completely based on who God is. And as a loving father, he always has the best for us in mind. He always responds appropriately, even when we don't like how he responds sometimes. Even if we don't understand his ways, his ways are perfect. So God is our loving father. Conclusion number four, my reality then has to be based upon God. My external circumstances don't determine my reality. What others say about me does not determine my reality. What I think about myself doesn't determine my reality. He alone determines my reality and my value because I'm greatly valued as a child of God. So we have to practice some truth statements from time to time and realize what is true and change our reality. As a believer, I'm alive. I'm not dead. That's good. I'm a saint, not a sinner. I'm a child of God. Those are immensely intimate things that God has. And my reality has to be based on what God calls us and who he says that we are. We're adopted sons and daughters. We're going to be with him forever through faith in Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thing. Conclusion number five. When all else fails, try remembering. If you're struggling in your circumstances, if you're trying to grasp who God is, if you're having trouble uh, letting yourself go or letting go of yourself, Sometimes we just need to remember. Take a moment and think about the past. How God sustained you maybe through an illness, maybe through a situation, how even in the death maybe of a loved one, you learned to cling to God, you, and you didn't die in the process. He allowed you to feel feelings of deep love in the process. Sometimes understanding who God is begins by looking backwards and realizing he's been there all along, step by step. It seemed to work for David in Psalm 145. He says, I remember, I call to mind, and I praise your name. God is unexplainably amazing. If we begin to grasp that as believers in a church, we'll be in the right spot for the next thing. Next week, we're going to explore what we believe about Jesus, but we're going to do some applications this morning. So I'm going to invite our music team to come up, and they're going to get prepared